Wonderful. Great. Well, uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome in Nathan Babel, who's our preservation office located here in Columbus. And Nathan will be presenting. And Nathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Alrighty, I'm Nathan Bubble with the State Historic Preservation Office, um, Community Planning and Preservation Manager, uh, which basically means I work a lot with local communities, uh, including some uh, main streets, uh, doing local commission work, and helping people help uh, protect their local historic districts and their communities. Uh, as a part of that work, I also do work on uh, historic rehabilitation tax credits. Um, I am going to give everyone a quick warning related to sounds. There is a construction site right outside of my window and as much as I try they will not stop and so if you hear a random jackhammer going off uh, that is why. So what we're here to talk about today are the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, what I'm going to get into is what are the standards based on that? What are the treatments for historic properties in general? Uh, because the Park Service has more than just standards for rehabilitation. Um, getting into what the actual standards for rehabilitation are. Uh, if you've seen a presentation by me previously, you've probably heard me talk about them. Uh, and I've given a little bit of information about the standards. but I'm going to do obviously a little bit of a deeper dive. And then finally, we're going to get into actually applying the Secretary of Interior standards. Uh, some of that will be related to tax credit projects, but also hopefully applicable material to if you're doing local design review or even working with your own house. And then finally, we get into the Q&A. So what are the treatments for historic properties? Uh, the first treatment is preservation, which basically means you have a building and you're keeping it in the condition it currently exists. Uh, I know we all like to throw around the word preservation and everything, but when it comes to the National Park Service and a specific treatment, this is what they mean. Uh, and the example here is actually the bank, uh, Sullivan Bank down in Sydney. Um, it's essentially, for most intents and purposes, been frozen in time. They've made a few security upgrades, but everything down to the water fountain inside uh, is as it was designed and was built. Restoration is when you have a property that may have been altered over time, but is being taken back to a very specific period of time. Uh, typically, preservation and restoration are going to be museum level work. Uh, restoration, it may go as far as removing electricity and plumbing from a building, um, or it may just be upgrading it and bringing back historic designs and features and elements. So wallpapers and trim and paint colors, uh, getting back some of those historic features and finishes, but they need to be accurate and they have to be what has been well documented for that property. Reconstruction is one of the most extreme examples. Uh, this is actually when there is appropriate documentation of a building and then you're able to go in and completely reconstruct based on that documentation. Uh, the example I have here is the old state house, uh, the version that was done in Chillicothe, which was rebuilt for the newspaper. Uh, however, the build more potential famous example is the governor's mansion and old capital in Williamsburg, uh, which were based on some copper plates found at Oxford. Um, but those were reconstructions. Those buildings had been demolished and they actually went back and completely rebuilt them. And again, this is typically a little bit more of a museum treatment of the property. Finally, we get to what most of us are thinking about when we start talking about the standards or when we start talking about what, is, what we're doing with a project, and that's rehabilitation. In short, rehabilitation recognizes 
that a property has changed in the past, that you may be can keeping those changes, that you have historic features and finishes left in the building, but certain things will have to change, certain compatible things will have to change to make it actually usable for the future. And so things will change, systems will be upgraded, bathrooms and kitchens may be added, whatever have you, that it needs to be upgraded to actually meet modern usage. When we look at the standards, again, we throw the term around a lot, but there are a lot of uses, some of which you know about, some of which you may not have usually dealt with. Uh, local design review is going to be one of the primary uses of the standards. Uh, if you're a certified local government, you will actually, that you are required to follow the standards uh, for making your design review decisions. But it's also, if generally, if you, even if you're not a CLG and you have a local design review, chances are you're following either the full standards or at least sections of the standards in doing your local review. Uh, if you have a federally funded project, so if you have, for example, a grant, or some other funding source, usually you will be required to follow the standards. Sometimes people will actually use the standards to maintain their own property. They're not under an obligation, they just want to try and do something that is quote unquote correct. Um, and so people will on occasion use the standards for that purpose, that they're actually just doing their own work and doing their own maintenance issues. And then finally, the one that most people know the best, which is going to be historic rehabilitation tax credits. Um, inside, outside, the entire thing, the standards will be used to evaluate that entire property. And for that case, they're actually the standards are codified uh, to provide them with a little bit of extra heft. So what are the actual standards? Uh, basically, it's a set of 10, and it really boils down to three major principles of preserve historic character, repair versus replacement of historic materials, and then any alterations that occur should be compatible. Uh, it does, they do apply to all kinds of buildings, whether you have a small house that's being rehabilitated, part of a housing project, or if you have a church that's being turned into a brewery or a rock climbing wall or whatever, it does apply to any of those kinds of buildings. And the point, particularly when you're looking at this from the tax credit perspective, this is looking at both interiors and exteriors of the building, uh, which is a difference from local design review, which for most of the commissions that I work with here in Ohio, there's only one or two that do anything interior, but it does technically apply to both. So working with the standards, again, this applies to any kind of building, uh, whether you have a main street building that is getting some sprucing up uh, with colors and new awnings and new details. Uh, if you have a courthouse that's getting some work through a state or federal grant, uh, or again, if you just have your house that's being rehabilitated. Standard number one uh, is to find a compatible use. When you're evaluating a project or taking on a project, you need to decide what alterations may be needed to the building. Again, we're figuring you're going to be doing kitchens and bathrooms, especially if it's an apartment building. But if you're going a lot further than that, it's important to take note of what is actually going into those alterations. Is this something that's going to require very large, significant alterations? And if those alterations may result in the character of the building law being lost. So for example, in these cases, turn in, the warehouse was turned into apartments, the uh, upper building was turned into office buildings, it's an old jailer's residence, and sheriff's office, they were able to make the alterations and did not require a significant amount of change and they retained their historic character. 
This little guy, though, may pose other issues. If you were doing this as an individual rehabilitation, it may require a much larger addition to be financially feasible to take the historic tax credits. Uh, I have seen examples of this style of house um, and similar, though less decorative ones here in Columbus, down in German Village and other areas, where they've essentially built an addition onto the house that has doubled it, that overwhelms it. And so in that case, I would say the use or the change may not be compatible with that historic building. Uh, in a similar way, if you have to completely gut the interior of the building to make your new proposed use work, that may be an incompatible use. And so it's making sure that the use that you have for the end of that property is actually going to be something that will not destroy the character of that property. Standard number two is preserving historic character. What are the spaces, decorative elements, historic materials that are important to that historic building? What gives it that character that you feel that is old? Um, and then you look at, will the alterations that I am proposing result in a loss of those historic elements and historic character defining features? And so it, you are looking at the project of, am I going to do something that's going to remove my ability to understand the character of the building? So for example, we talk, I talk about materials in this case, this is down in Haydenville. Um, and in this case, it was a company town that manufactured the clay tile for uh, barns and usually for a lot of agricultural products. Uh, they also used it though for buildings throughout the city or the town, I guess I should say, or village. Um, the church, the post office, the general store, most of the houses were all built out of the same material. And so that specific glazed tile is an incredibly important character defining feature of all of the buildings within this area. But when you get into a tax credit or you get into some other buildings, sometimes this looks a little bit different. Uh, in this case, this is a building I believe up in Cleveland where most of the interior of the building was gone when they started the tax credit rehabilitation process. And so we were on the lookout in, as in consultant consultation with the owner that if there were any historic features that were found or that we, they uncovered in doing some of their work, that we needed to take a look at those and the potentially that they would need to be uh, maintained. In this case, uh, they took up some probably bad carpet or linoleum or something, and lo and behold, they actually found the original floor. Because there was so little left on the interior, that little bit of flooring became all the more important. And so as a part of the project, they then had to go in and actually maintain that flooring. Um, it's not all that common, um, but when you lose a lot of fabric, this standard becomes a lot more important. What is actually left that provides that character of the space? Standard number three, avoid a false sense of history. Um, this is usually the don't tart up your little worker's cottage to make it look like an East Lake or Victorian style mansion. Um, it's keeping of keeping away from doing something that is complete conjecture and making the ha building that you're that's in question looking entirely wrong. Um, as a part of this, I would also in recommend avoiding salvaged materials. Um, first and foremost, from a shippo perspective, we are concerned with that because that can encourage deconstruction for the sake of salvage. Um, but also those alterations and changes may not actually reflect the history of your building. It's important that your building maintains that sense of true history 
and maintains its actual uh, story as opposed to being something new and something that you really wanted to develop and that looks different. So you wouldn't put a colonial detail on a 19th century building that would be entirely inappropriate. Standard number four is to retain any alterations that have gained significance on their own. So do you have a change to your building that may be at a high level of craft or of style that they used really great materials, that it was the work of a great architect who made, designed an addition or an alteration, or is there something about that alteration that has in of itself become significant? Uh, in that case, it's important that you think very carefully about making that alteration. And indeed, if you are doing that, you probably should be keeping that alteration. So here we have an example from Circleville. Uh, in the bottom corner, they have a new storefront. Uh, this was probably, this is marble, Carrara glass, uh, very well done, very well designed storefront. Uh, clearly they did not spare any expense in making uh, their renovations or alterations to this storefront. Um, Admittedly, if we were looking at this from a General Historic Preservation Commission perspective, it probably wouldn't be allowed. Um, it's a significant alteration, involves painting the brick, uh, and it's taking out what would have been an original, much more simple storefront based on the what was left and the historic character of the building. However, that addition tells a very significant story about the business that was there, and it's a high, high level of craftsmanship for that individual storefront. So if this were coming in, for example, for design review, or if this company was deciding to go look into a tax credit, we would urge them under the standards to actually maintain at least that storefront. They may be able to change out the orange paint, but in general, we are looking that they would want to save that original historic storefront. Um, also, considering that it is now 2020, that was no doubt designed and built at a period that would be within the period of significance of that historic district. So if you're looking at an entire district of places, it's going to have a period of significance. It's important to consider what is that time frame if that new addition is going to help tell that story, uh, as opposed to the wooden storefront beside it, there's not a high level of materials. It's not really a great design and therefore we probably would say it's okay for that to come off and they might do some work, maybe a restoration actually of that storefront uh, to make it more compatible with the rest of that building. Standard number five is to maintain distinctive features. So this is where we are looking at very important examples of craftsmanship, of what is exemplifying the historic materials, what are those building materials, what are those elements that must be preserved. Uh, this is tied to standard number two, uh, but this is a little bit more looking at those distinctive features and finishes of the building and how they are impacted by your work. Uh, so here we have an example of some decorative terracotta work. Clearly you're going to wanna preserve that and maintain that historic character of the building, that distinctive feature. Um, here we have an example of something we see far, far too often. <clears throat> Thankfully it's usually when that drop ceiling is going away, but that historic character of that space, if you can imagine that grid filled in uh, with salt and pepper colored drop ceiling tiles, how much different that space would seem as opposed to having decorative columns, capitals, and all of the coffered ceilings with all of that intricate detail. 
it's important to maintain that level of finish. This was a grand space. It was not meant to look like a you know a hospital lobby. It was meant to look like a grand space and therefore something that you would want to maintain if you were coming in and changing that space. Um, sometimes this is also involved with the volume of the space um, and looking at what the historic features are of that volume and if that needs to be retained. And then sometimes, you know, you can kind of make the joke of what they're going to look like with distinctive features. Uh, clearly, this building would have had a mansard roof, uh, also would have had better windows at one point. Um, that, that distinctive feature and craftsmanship of that mansard roof is completely lost by putting on what is essentially amounts to a Pizza Hut hat. Standard number six is where windows usually come in, um, but is really one of the meatiest standards for what we're looking at when it actually comes to materials. The more materials you replace on a building, the newer the building becomes. So if you are working on a building and you have to replace the flooring because it's been too scuffed up. You end up replacing the exterior siding of the building because that's been messed up. You rip out all the interior walls to do all of your electric, so most of that is gone. You rip out the ceilings because, again, you're doing your electric and plumbing. Those are gone. The roofs are going to change no matter what. Eventually, you go through all of those changes and eventually it gets to a point where you don't have a historic building you have a new looking building. Now, we know that in most cases, you can't 100% repair something uh, if it is too far deteriorated. And so the flip side of that is, if something is beyond all reasonable repair, it must be replaced in kind. So you should be looking at this that it is replaced with the same kinds of materials. Now, we may not necessarily say that you have to go and find the exact same species of wood to put down for your flooring, but we are looking for a similar material. You may not be able to go in and do LVT flooring if you have wood floors and most of the wood floors are in good shape. Um, but those replacements should match the characteristics of those historic materials. So for example, here in an effort to repair rather than replace, uh, this floor joist was actually damaged beyond repair uh, by powder post beetle damage. Uh, however, the owner decided that they really didn't want to lose some of that historic fabric. It told a story and it has a very distinctive look now. Uh, and so they decided to actually do some sistering on those original beams to hold up that floor joist. And so they took the pattern of going in and doing a sistering and a repair rather than complete and total replacement of those historic elements. Standard number seven is to do no damage. Usually this one is, thou shalt not sandblast. Uh, any cleaning or repair work should not damage that original historic fabric. Uh, sandblasting is never gonna be a good thing. Walnut shell blasting is never going to be a good thing. It's going to abrade the surface of that building. It's also important that if you are using any kind of chemicals, any kinds of sealants, any of these other materials, that you do test patches and let them weather. Because while something might look great for, you know, you apply it now when it's springtime, might be a little bit wet, but it's going to be fairly warm. However, you apply that chemical right now, then come winter, we get our first couple freeze thaws, and you realize 
that it has done irreparable damage to that stone or that brickwork. So for example, you might get this, where sealant was used on parts of this column, the sealant soaked in to a small amount, and then once they were able to go, once the freeze-thaw cycle set in, it actually spalled parts of the column off, which then helped with the deterioration because it's sandstone, so it had a lot more uh, wear and tear and washing away because sandstone is naturally a small, uh, uh, soft stone. And so now they're going in and they're having to try and find new patches that can fit into those spaces and cavities and repair the building. It's never going to look like it did with the great graining. Um, and so there is irreparable damage that has been done to these columns. <clears throat> Eventually they may actually have to end up being replaced if too much of that historic material ends up washing away. And then the usual example of what to avoid when you're looking at brickwork. Um, this is why we'd say to never actually sandblast your brick. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right that the wall actually has a wavy appearance. This is because the bricks were originally a fairly straightforward and uh, even height. With the sandblasting, it threw off all of that protective material, and then essentially they have now weathered at different rates because the bricks are fired at different heats and therefore have a tendency to wear at different rates because they're harder and softer depending upon where they were in the kiln as they were being fired. Um, on the left is a little bit of a more close-up view uh, where they added a little bit of insult to injury by putting in a bunch of Portland cement to hold things together, uh, which is also leading to spalling. But that bad mortar is also where that comes in for doing no damage, that you don't want to put in an incorrect mortar, something that's going to be too hard for that brick. You want to make sure you use something that's going to allow it to breathe, to wick away moisture, and then to give way if it needs to, to preserve that original brick material. Standard number eight is one that most people probably think, oh, that'll never apply to my project. And that's to protect archeological resources. Um, you say that, but then I know of a specific project that they were digging an elevator shaft and in fact encountered uh, burials. There is always a chance you're going to encounter an archeological site. Um, Ohio has been settled for a very long time, uh, not just by those of European descent, and all of those people have left behind remains, left behind objects. There is a lot there that could be underground. And in an urban setting, it's especially true that there are lots of cisterns and other caches of artifacts that are as of yet uncovered. In this case, uh, this image is actually from New Orleans. I had one or two uh, foreign examples in here. Uh, they had a building collapse and they actually, before they were able to rebuild, had an archeological class come in uh, to do a dig to find out what was underneath of what was the building that was built on before. And then also, if you are encounter those issues, it's making sure that you do take appropriate mitigation issues. Uh, digging everything up and putting it in a pile and then calling someone later is never the appropriate thing to do. Uh, you really do need to contact with a professional archeologist to work with anything that's related to archeology. span Standard number nine is 
new work cannot damage or destroy historic fabric or character. So everything that you do must be contemporary and compatible. So any additions clearly have to be new. You can't do an addition that looks exactly like it does on the historic building. Um, and any new addition must also be compatible with that building. So if you're, you're doing a tax credit or using this in a historic district, you're probably not going to go get the latest Starkitect designed building that can make that fill in. Uh, you're going to have to find and have something designed that's going to be toned down a little bit, that's going to be more contemporary, but it's still going to be compatible with that historic district. It's, this is where it's important to think about what that historic character is. It's also important that any addition avoids a false sense of history. Again, was that addition originally built? Uh, is it designed by a specific architect? Um, and making sure you don't give the impression that this building used to be twice the size as it was with this new addition because it looks exactly like the historic same time any new addition cannot overwhelm the historic building you can't have an addition that's put on there that will completely obliterate the historic character and design of that original building you can't build a gigantic again five-story tower next to a three-story main street building so sometimes this is you want to incorporate the building beside you. So you give your building a little skirt, um, completely uh, corralling it in, doing something that's entirely incompatible with the original design of this building. Um, ironically, though, this is potentially getting close to that 50 year mark. And in some cases, depending upon the commission, may be considered eligible in of itself. Uh, but largely we are looking at this would be an incompatible addition. Uh, in a similar matter, uh, sadly not being in person, I can't do my usual quiz show on this one. Um, the second building in from the right uh, is an addition to the bank. Uh, the building on the end with all of the terracotta detail is a Louis Sullivan designed bank uh, up in Columbus, Wisconsin. Uh, one of a handful of his jewel boxes. The bank needed an expansion. I believe the building, I'm not sure what happened to the building beside it. Um, they needed a new bank building. They needed a new addition because they couldn't fit all of their operations into that historic building. And so the new building takes this design cues. It very clearly fits into that vocabulary of the rest of the street. However, it has very distinct cues that it is new and that it is a different kind of a building. Um, they never would have had just a simple metal I-beam as basically the transom for the windows uh, over the storefront. Um, the windows are much more simple than everything else that's uh, most of the other windows in the, in the entire row. Um, the top, the cornice is a lot more simple and, you know, the really big dead giveaway is the fact that it does in fact have the date, which I believe is 2009 or 6, um, in the signage block. And so clearly we know when that was built. And so it gives that, it echoes that historic detail, but then also clearly indicates that it is new. And then finally, standard number 10, make sure that any alterations or changes to the building are reversible. Any new work, again, must preserve the integrity of the historic building. However, I do need to point out that this does not mean that you have carte blanche that if you connect your building or have a dividing wall and say, well, this is a reversible change. I'm putting this addition on, but it's reversible. It's no big deal. Any project, anything that we're working on 
has to meet all 10 of the standards. And so just because the alteration you make may technically just be held on by a small connector, it must meet, that addition must also meet the rest of the standards. And so just because something may be reversible does not mean it's actually 100% in the okay if it violates the other standards. So, uh, and going through a few projects to give you some ideas on actually applying the standards for rehabilitation. Uh, this is an example, one that we see most frequently um, is the replacement of windows. Uh, usually someone does a little bit better job than finding the hardware store special. But clearly looking at these windows, the historic character of this building is being altered by the loss of these windows. We had very thin, very elegant looking original windows, filled the opening, and actually had a bright, clean look. Sure, they probably needed some repair, but in general, they were in salvageable condition and could be brought up to better code. Um, this is also where the repair versus replace would come in because these windows could very easily be repaired and therefore reflect additional historic fabric that should be kept on that historic building. Uh, one of our more famous examples, one of the first major projects we saw with the state tax credits, um, this building clearly had its gigantic metal screen on the front of it. Um, this is an example of an addition that would not have met the standards um, and that it has not gained significance on its own. Uh, there's no great significant design element to this screen. Um, and in this case, clearly, when we reviewed it, there was no question that that screen could go away. Thankfully, underneath, they did have the full building. It was, the facade had not been chiseled off and everything was still there. And so it has been fully restored now, or uh, excuse me, rehabilitated now um, to bring back that historic character. Um, repainted in this case because it needed to be, uh, but they really were able to bring back that historic building. Um, again, new windows um, that were echoing what had been there um, and other design features that just echoed what that building used to be. Uh, this is a fairly recent project um, that was completed. Uh, what you may not be able to see, probably on purpose, or really on purpose, is the addition on the right. So this is the front facade of the building. You can see on the right, there's a little bit of bushes and shrubbery, um, but this is the new addition. In this case, they followed the standards by echoing the design of the building. So they made sure that there was some crenellation, that it had that up and high and low style of design. It echoes the material. It's a buff colored brick and it's a buff colored stone on the building. So there is a difference in the material, but it very clearly is related to, it's in that same color family and has that echo of the original design. Um, also, looking at the windows, the shapes of the windows of the addition mimic the windows on the side of the building. So therefore, it has that same design vocabulary as the rest of that main building. On the inside, uh, this is an important uh, alteration in that they kept this large open space. Uh, this was the auditorium. I believe it actually was also lunchroom. Um, in this case, they were able to keep the stage 
that was there. Uh, it is modified, uh, but they also, the most important thing is kept that open volume. Uh, one of the things we see in a lot of different tax credit projects is the subdivision of this larger space. And that is frankly a very difficult thing to do, uh, especially depending upon how many large open spaces are available in there. This is where that standard number two comes in, preserving that historic character. Any school you go into of this era is going to have one or more large open spaces. It is therefore important that some of those spaces are kept. In some cases, you can have a project where they would be infilled, but by and large, if you were going for the tax credit, you would be pushed to keep as many of them as possible because each of them has very distinct design features related to each, and they have their own characteristics and that we're looking to preserve those aspects. Uh, another feature I would like to point out on this is how we sometimes try to deal with different code related issues. Uh, in this case, if you notice on the larger photograph, the railing at the top, if you look very closely, you can see an extra line that is above the black uh, end of the black railing that they actually had to add some glass to make it code compliant because the railing was too tall or too short, excuse me. So in this case, they found an alteration that blended in and disappeared. It was an alteration that was compatible. And at the end of the day, if they needed to take that railing down, they could. It was just placed in there, drilled in some places on the railing, and it could be removed. Here again is some examples of looking at that uh, pattern of movement pattern of what is happening on the interior of the building and when you lack historic features. Um, these are some examples from down in Cincinnati and over the Rhine. Um, on the upper example, we would be asking the question is if this was potentially an original wall. In this case, it's important to take your design cues from what the walls look like, what you were looking at in the building to see if this may actually be a historic feature of the building. There's not a whole lot left. There weren't a lot of decorative features. There wasn't a lot of great historic fabric left. However, looking at that baseboard, this probably was an original wall. So some aspect of that wall should be kept. If not the whole wall itself, you would probably be looking at the location of it. Uh, on the lower photo, this is really where this is. you would look at the location. Clearly, most of these walls were new. Uh, looking at those two by fours, they were clearly of a newer vintage. That's not 19th century construction. However, if you notice in the floor, there is that threshold. It would be important if you were doing, for example, a tax credit, that you would be examining if that is potentially an original threshold. If that was an original wall and there is so little historic fabric left in this building, then that location becomes more important. We would be looking at that division to say, this is something we should probably be keeping. And so if you were changing the layout of this room, we would be looking at where that wall is and recommending that you would be keeping that wall where it was, that there is something there that indicates that historically this is where that division was. In this case, uh, again, this would apply to both the tax credit and to local design review. Um, we're dealing with a lot of new 
materials when it comes to looking at modern buildings. Um, and there are a lot of design features that fit some of that Main Street vocabulary, but are definitely new materials and a slightly different look. Uh, in this case, this office building has the spandrel glass above and below the windows. Um, no storefronts from the 19th century ever would have had something like that. Uh, in this case, we would be looking at what alterations are proposed or were proposed and making sure that those glass elements are being retained. And then you would have to be matching those more closely, which quite frankly can sometimes be a little bit difficult uh, based on manufacturing and what is currently available. But in this case, for this building, that glass is a very important design feature. The fabric and the material is really important for looking at this overall character of the building. Here is another example. This is inside of a school. And this is where looking at the circulation patterns becomes incredibly important. Uh, we see a lot of schools that are turned into store, uh, housing. And if any of you remember the last time you were in a classroom, you probably want a room that's a little bit bigger than what the typical classroom is if it's your entire apartment. And therefore, we usually have an in case where people want to double the size of the rooms, connect the rooms, and not use the doorways. In a case like this, in a school like this, you're probably going to have to keep the doors and then you would just end up fixing them shut. Um, the pattern and the repetitiveness of the doorways in a hallway like this are what then becomes important because this is the public space. We're looking at this public space and we want to see how this space originally functions. Uh, there is some flexibility when you get inside of those rooms but for the most part, it goes in a hierarchy of spaces and first and foremost looks at what are the actual public spaces that a person entering this building would see. In a similar manner, you would look at an open floor plan uh, and the columns that divide it and have to carefully consider if you are doing division in this space. Um, in this case, we usually see the reverse of what we sometimes see. People will want to divide the space up, add in hallways, add in corridors, and completely divide this up. What we would be looking at is how are these columns still expressed? And making sure that, in some cases, whole columns are expressed. We would also be looking at the volume of the space can we actually see what the original hall would have looked like? You know, if you go in and you chop up every single element, add in new doors, every column is engaged or completely covered, and everything completely becomes a warren of hallways, you then lose that entire sense that this was a manufacturing building, and therefore this entire space was open. This is where you start pulling in that standard one. Is the use that I'm proposing for this going to be compatible with this space? But it's also the standard two of historically, this was a large open space. How are we going to actually fit and maintain that historic character, fabric, and sense of historic context? Uh, jumping back to schools, um, again, looking at the distinct design features, um, what is going to be put into these classrooms, reusing them, how are they going to resemble what they once were. Um, in this case, to maintain that classroom sense of space, they actually maintain the chalkboards. Um, and if this is a possibility in your project, we will be looking for that to be kept because 
this is one way that even on the interior, I believe it's a one bedroom and so it's not a whole lot of extra space, you can tell that that space was a classroom. And so it has that distinct connection to its historic use and the historic design features that were extant in that building. In this case, again, we're maintaining those design features and we end up having to add something in that, quite frankly, if you've done a project with us, we don't always like to see, which is exposed ductwork and wiring. Um, however, that historic design feature of the pressed metal ceiling is incredibly important to the character of that space. And therefore, it became far more important that that ceiling was maintained and therefore it met the standards to keep the ceiling while still painting out and keeping some of that exterior the lighting and the HVAC and MEP work because the historic fabric and the historic character would have been even more severely altered had they gone to a smooth ceiling that would have concealed all of that. And then it's also important, again, in this to repair, repair and replace, but making sure that you have good design, um, that you are maintaining that space and maintaining that fabric, and that we do sometimes allow that things will change. Um, and in this case, again, we would be looking that you would be using some of the floor plans, but we would not be expecting that you would keep all of these damaged materials. And then finally, another example of a contemporary compatible addition. Um, this is another out of state example down in Georgia. Um, probably would have recommended if I had been there from the start of this project that they did the roof line a little bit different. But the historic house is in the front. You can see that clearly from the changes in the wood that the brick foundation and the damage to the wood siding. Um, but the addition is definitely deferential. It's much more simple. The base is a lot different and the whole addition is therefore compressed and looks different and is toned down from that original house. And then finally, uh, what we're looking at for an apartment, or a apartment building that was in, or a hotel that was turned to apartment building Again, they had a lot of room to work and they were able to insert really almost whatever they wanted on the interior because it had lost so much of that historic fabric. All right, I hear the uh, sirens going off, so clearly it's noon. Um, and we can open this up to some questions. Yes, that was your um, air siren time check. Yes. So I appreciate the presentation and the slides. Uh, some very cringeworthy. I have this dream that one day I'm going to be in Clearsville, and I'm going to see that that house has had that uh, black asphalt shingle box removed, and there's going to be a beautiful Second Empire slate and and cupola windows or. Uh, Something a little bit more beautiful, right? Than, uh, One day. Someday. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question box. Windows. So let's play a little repair or replace, all right? I will I will give you a condition and you say repair or replace okay ready nathan okay okay uh the sash ropes are broken or missing can i replace them with them? if it's actually actually frank you you've keep fading out a little bit but if it were just just sash ropes and everything no you would you would have to keep the window My, um, 
I can't hear you, Frank. Oops. Huh. Hmm. I am not sure what's happening with this microphone. Let's try one more time. <laughs> okay. How about if my windows are painted shut? No, why don't you get away replacing them? <laughs> what we're looking um, for for replacement in windows is one, if there's only like one or two left and there's therefore no real historic fabric that it's you know remnant condition essentially um or if they really are completely beyond repair that it is the wood is checked the wood is rotted there is absolutely no way that that historic fabric is salvageable but so in any case you still have of softness or rot that more than likely compare those were you able to hear that nope not all of it i heard the i heard something about rot okay well i am not sure what's happening with this um but it is not working. Um, but I am open for questions if anyone wants to type them in. Uh, so we did have a question regarding the slides. Yeah, we will have a uh, top of the presentation, which uh, shows the slides and includes Nathan's voice that uh, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. It's just going to lead you into the security channel to be able to uh, access the recording uh, from uh, Classic Grace. Plus, we did have the slides and the handouts, which you can access uh, now as we speak. I hope someone heard that. <laughs> Did you hear that, Nathan? Not all of it. But no. Oh my it. God. Okay. Um, let me just try unplugging this microphone. Okay, so that might change the quality of uh, my audio, but can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, in case people didn't hear that, uh, I had a question about the slides or the recording being available and the recording will be uh, uploaded to our youtube channel in a couple days just go to youtube and search under heritage ohio hopefully did you hear that entire answer nathan yes okay all right there must be something with our microphone that's uh, having a problem uh so a question so windows again, a big issue with residential repair is the claim that they want to replace due to that window sash being single pane and they need more efficiency. So what is the response when you have that question? Typically with that, um, one, I would say, have they looked into weather stripping and other less radical changes to the window that they could make that would equal some of that energy efficiency so has your is your weather stripping and your caulking all up to snuff um the other side of that is have you considered storm windows which you can get a compatible storm window which would be far more appropriate than again full scale replacements um, the next step on that is 
you do also have to look at repair and repairing what you have. Um, will you get energy savings from that replacement? Is that where you actually have the air infiltration and those problems coming from? Uh, most of your air is coming a lot more from like basements and attic spaces and everything that aren't properly insulated as opposed to windows. It's actually a little bit of a smaller percentage. Um, and therefore, it's important to think of other different ways that's a bit more cost effective, frankly, than going in and completely replacing them. Um, because that is also not always a cost effective alteration to go in and completely replace all of your windows. Um, that's usually a pretty hefty uh, alteration, but it's also what is going into um, those replacement, what's the warranty on them, what's the maintenance like on them. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, does the preservation office have a preference? Because window companies can sell exterior storms and now interior storms also. It depends upon the window. Um, generally speaking, we would probably prefer, in most cases, exterior, simply because it protects the historic fabric. Mm -hmm. um, but it, with any of these things, and that's one of the issues with any kind of a project in general, everything truly is project specific. I have seen some where if you have a very specific design of window, or style of window, or uh, decorative feature, you may not be able to do a storm, or an interior may be more appropriate. But mm -hmm. as a general, we would probably say push a little bit more for exterior, just for the fact that it actually protects that original historic window. So along the same lines, we had a question, uh, if you have uh, verifiable information on energy rating for a restored single pane window. What is its U rating as a comparison to replacement windows? I do not have that number readily available. I believe the National Trust did do a study. I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm not sure if it was repaired or if they had gone to um, storm window. But to my mm -hmm. knowledge, if I remember that study correctly, though, I think it, I think it was storm. But they said it was actually a similar, or if not better, R value um, for the storm window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, essentially I... doing the storm window creates the double pane. And it has a much wider uh, barrier of air in it. Right, right. I think uh, the, the knowledge is that a single pane window, a single pane original wood window will not be as energy efficient as a new off the shelf, weather stripped, uh, double pane vinyl window. Um, but as you point out, there are things you can do like adding weather stripping, adding exterior storms um, that help to bring it into a comparable or even superior uh, U rating amount. Uh, Timothy, let me look to see if we have information because I know people have covered these on and off over the years using more of a technical analysis and I will see if I can get that uh, information to you. We have a question, <clears throat> how about, um, how are archeological deposits defined as far as when further analysis or mitigation would be needed? Generally speaking, if you're finding um, a lot of deposits, Generally speaking, what usually triggers the most concern is when remains are found. Um, technically, if you're finding large deposits, 
you may help to just call the shippo if you know if you're finding like you find a cistern or something and there may be something and you're concerned about it then i would say reach out um remains is really though when things become much more problematic mm -hmm. but if you find something like a cistern you find something um, I would either reach out to us or you may talk to like local historical society. Um, but it's when you're going to find something that's going to be rich in resources and that's when it's important to reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I mean, generally, like I said, the, the instance I had, they were digging and they actually found the remains underneath the elevator shaft. So it was pretty clear at that point. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so how about, uh, so if I've come into possession of a building, it's part of a National Register Historic District, uh, but the windows were replaced long ago, it now has crappy vinyl windows in them. Can I get tax credit approval if I do a like for like and put in uh, new vinyl windows to replace the nasty crappy vinyl windows that I had? Uh, first of all, adding in all of the caveats that would be appropriate. Um, if you're doing a tax credit, it's going to be have to be an income producing property. Yep. Um, so if you had, if you're taking something out and we're looking at this, and this is again, thinking about this through the lens of tax credit, but technically also design review. If you're taking something out, you that's where you then start coming into the contemporary compatible and uh finding something that's going to be more appropriate for that building um vinyl is still very iffy um i don't i don't know of any just off over the counter stock vinyl that is readily available that you probably would be able to use. Mm -hmm. um, if you're getting a tax credit, they're going to push for something that will be a better match. Um, and when we're looking at the better match, it doesn't have to be, excuse me, it does not have to match. There's nothing to match it to, but it has to be in a more appropriate window. And it would have to have details that are compatible with a historic window. So that might be that it's, you know, uh, I've seen recently some replacements where basically it looked like it was just a something, a flat piece of glass with, uh, you know, looked like that magnet strip stuff they used to use pasted on it. Mm -hmm. We would need something that looks more like a realistic window, whether that's all for uh, uh, operational offsets, whether that's having... Uh, three-dimensional muntins and interior muntins, um, whether that's spacer bars between those, um, whether that is, you know, getting into miter joints and all of those other things that you need on the edges of the window, so in the shadow lines, so that it looks, again, like that appropriate historic window. Um, it's kind of, once you go over that line, then that's when we would look at some of those elements that we do a window that's going to look more appropriate to that historic building. Okay, very good. That, but if um, you find a vinyl window though that that can do that, then you could bring it up and we could try. Mm -hmm. okay. We take a look. All right. So um, looking at that, thou shalt not sandblast stand. Uh, you mentioned the sandblasting. Yeah, water shells, ice beads. What about from a standpoint of pressure washing? Are there do's and don'ts as far as the the force, the the distance from the building, the orientation of the spray, upward or downward? Um, what do you all look at when you get a proposal that says, you know, either brick or wood siding? Yeah. We're gonna start by pressure washing. Generally speaking, it has to be under, I believe it's 300 PS, 30? Oh, now you caught me out, I'm blanking on the number. 
it's got to basically it can't be any stronger than garden hose pressure. So there's a particular um, so PSI have, number. I think it's 300. Okay. But that sounds really high for some reason to me. Don't quote me. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, but what essentially they're looking at is, you know, talking about nozzle or direction or anything. Sure, you could sit there and use a garden hose, but then you put on that super high powered, you know, super soaker version of a hose nozzle. That's going to raise that PSI. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep it at that gentle uh, water pressure. And then you would never use anything more than a bristle brush. Like some people would say, well, I'm going to use a wire brush to go in and scrape it down. You would never use a wire brush, especially on like brick or wood. It's going to scrape away that historic material because that metal is going to be harder than the brick or the wood. And so the goal is to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're not you're only pulling away at some of the dirt. Um, sometimes with brick, we just say leave it; it's patina. You know, it gives it character. Right. Um, but you know, if you've got like biologic matter on there, then yeah, you're going to have to use. But sometimes it's basically just use some non-ionic detergent, which no, I don't know what brand that is. You have to make sure it just says it on the bottle because though sometimes you might look at some of the organic stuff and see if it says it. Um, we used to know brands and then I think the brands have all changed. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah, I think because I think I actually looked one time I was in the store and they had one or two brands that they always used to talk about and I'm like, it doesn't say it anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, that would be where I would definitely, you know, you could Google some of that and then also just you, you know, look at some of the organic ones i think some of those fall into that category mm -hmm. okay. um, but you would just use that just do like some soap and water and you know use the, the hose and kind of just rinse it right okay all right uh anyone have any last questions enter them into the question box now have you all ever experienced a case where you have a historic building, but you had a feature that was under-engineered, like say uh, decorative gutters, but the gutters were so shallow that they don't do a very good job of keeping water off of the exterior of the building, or maybe like a storefront or like a commercial building cornice that was uh, poorly engineered or say even an old building where the roof joists were undersized. How, how do you deal with something that is a historic piece of the building, but maybe from today's engineering standpoints wouldn't pass code? Typically with the, I, I have not seen any of those in projects that we have worked on. Um, however, if I'm not mistaken, they actually had that issue with falling water, um, that through some aspect of design and Franklin Rice design, I think, I don't know if it was water infiltration or just the expanse of some of the cantilevers, they were running into very serious structural issues because the cantilevers were eventually starting to give way. Um, and so they had to go in and do a very sensitive intervention that maintained again as much stored fabric as possible, but also to do some further strengthening. Um, so I have seen it happen. Um, usually you can find an intervention that's going to have the least amount of negative impacts, but generally that's what you're gonna be looking for though, is what's gonna do the least amount of damage to this historic building by doing this intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And it's making that careful, you know, it, it may change the design. And so that's where you look at what is the historic character defining feature? Is there a way to, you know, it may end up be some mimicking of that, uh, depending upon what the specific problem is. Okay. All right. I uh, did have a question from Suzanne. He writes, if I have to replace windows that are beyond repair, is it totally unacceptable to use like windows 
that are salvaged from a demolished house in the same town of the same era? Again, we typically shy away from the salvage. Um, in that case, I would say that would depend, you know, you have to look at fit, whether they're going to be appropriate for the building. Um, you know, if you're just doing this as a general homeowner, not coming into it with any kind of a funding hook, a tax credit hook, or local design review, um, you would just have to see if they fit. The problem is sometimes with those kinds of windows, depending upon what era the building is, they were built for that building and therefore may not have appropriate um, dimensions that are going to work without doing a lot of modification. Mm -hmm. Okay, but say so generally the... speaking, we would we would you know. Generally speaking, we're not because it's that slightly it's on some level that false sense of history. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it's um, right, okay. But if it's a good fit, you're doing it on your own, then and it's not a tax credit project, then no one's going to tell you. No one's going to say no. <laughs> yeah, we're not coming around to every single house in the state and saying, "Did you do this? If so, you're bad." Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Nathan, I, I've got to say that that's one of those, you know, as a preservationist and the sustainability piece of it and uh, old growth wood as a non-renewable resource, um, you know, I, I think about that. And yep. if, if there was a way that, um, like in my own personal house, say, uh, like if there's a, uh, what do they call those uh, deed books that used to come with the, that used to come with the house that the owners passed down to one another. Like if you included a note about your house saying, oh, by the way, the, oh. the windows in, in the uh, upstairs bedroom, I, I got them from the house down the street as they were demoing it, um, you know, to, to keep that, um, that timeline in place. Um, it, it, it seems like that might be, you know, from a personal standpoint, that might be an acceptable time to do something like using salvage. Um, but, um, anyways, yes, when it comes to the standards and tax credit projects, it's, um, you know, salvage is not typically an approved treatment. So uh, at this point, I do not see any other questions. So um, Nathan, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and educating us on the standards and uh, the good discussion on questions afterwards. I'd like to invite you all to check out our weekly e-blasts. They come out every Tuesday. They have information on our latest webinars that are coming up. Um, I don't have information for our next one, but I believe we should have one coming up within a couple weeks. So stay tuned to our eblast, our website. Um, otherwise, I wish you all a good afternoon and try to stay dry in Ohio. We've gotten a lot of rain. I'll see you later. Bye. Thank you.